Welcome to this Doughty Street Chambers Court of Protection Team webinar. I'm Aswini Weeraratnan, a member of Doughty Street and your chair and moderator this afternoon. Today we're looking at the case of DP in Hillingdon, in which the Vice President recently considered the court's approach to the doll challenges brought under sections 21A of the Mental Capacity Act and the use of interim orders under section 48 of the Mental Capacity Act. I'm going to turn shortly to the expert analysis of Leonie Hurst and Oliver Lewis, who was junior counsel led by Victoria Butler Cole QC and instructed by Keith Clark at Burton Yarsi Solicitors. But first I'm going to turn to what is also obligatory, the housekeeping. I wanted to start by introducing new members of our team and I'm proud to introduce Leonie Hurst and Shushin Liu as our newest members. But this good news is tempered with such sadness over the sudden death of Stephen Nathler, QC, over the weekend. A hugely respected and admired lawyer, noted for his housing and community care work, many of you will have known him well, and he was uh, due to speak at this webinar before he fell ill. I'd like you to invite you, therefore, to honour him now with a minute's silence. Thank you. Let's proceed. The format for today, please, as ever, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens for questions and comments. Uh, no PowerPoints today, but you will receive a recording and a list of cases referred to with citations after the webinar. Please forgive me if I don't spend time applauding the talents and achievements of the speakers today. Biographies will also be sent out to you after we finish. We have a knowledgeable audience joining us today, so our discussions will assume some familiarity with the Mental Capacity Act provisions. So it's been 12 years since the Mental Capacity Act came into force, and it's always good to take stock uh, and go back to examine practice that has developed in, in this instance in relation to Section 21A, doll challenges and the use of Section 48 interim orders. Let me start with some brief background and a summary of DP. This was a successful appeal against the decision of a deputy district judge not to terminate immediately a standard authorization for want of an adequate capacity assessment. At the first hearing on P's behalf, the court was asked to terminate the standard authorization on the basis that the capacity evidence was so weak that it did not replace or displace the presumption of capacity so that the mental capacity requirement in paragraph 15 of Schedule A1 of the MCA was not met. The capacity evidence of the Schedule A1 assessor was analyzed without oral evidence, and the decision of the Deputy District Judge shows that she grappled with its inadequacies and considered it to be sufficient for the purposes of the interim capacity declaration that she made under Section 48. The determination, I might say, that was made after a one hour telephone hearing. I'm going to highlight just five points from the Vice President's judgment on Section 21A. Firstly, the court's approach to Section 21A applications is different to and distinct from its role in a standard welfare application. Under Section 21A, its only function is to determine whether P meets the, qu the qualifying requirements on the available evidence. This is because Article 5.4 of the Convention is engaged by the Dole Challenge and requires a speedy determination um, of Section 21A applications. 
Section 48 on its express terms does not permit the making of interim declarations. In the Section 21A context, no interim declaration of capacity is required from the court while the standard authorization remains in place and until it expires, is suspended or terminated by the supervisory body or the court. While it remains in force, the standard authorization provides authority for the doll so that the court does not need to replicate that authority and there's no need for any interim remedy to do so. However, exceptionally, the court may gather more information before it decides the application, as long as it does so speedily. It does this by making appropriate case management decisions to enable it to determine whether P meets the requirements. If P does not meet the qualifying requirements, the court must exercise its Section 21A powers to vary or terminate the standard authorization. One of many questions that then arises is what is the basis for the authorization of any continuing de facto doll while the local authority gets its house in order? P cannot left, be left in limbo or P may not have walked out the door the moment she was free to leave. One suggestion I've read is that section 4B MCA is the only route, but I suggest that this is too narrow because it specifically limits a doll to life-sustaining treatment or where there's a need to prevent a serious deterioration in peace condition. Practitioners should remember the availability of an interim remedy, including expressly interim declarations under part 10.10 .10 of the Court of Protection rules, underpinned by section 47, which gives the Court of Protection the same powers as the High Court. These are the court's general powers and distinct from specific powers as in section 48. And I think this permits the court to make interim declarations and orders pursuant to sections 15 1c, 16 and 4a as a result. They permit the court to investigate capacity and best interests fresh and to authorize any doll if appropriate. These general powers underpin the interim declarations that are routinely made at the outset of welfare proceedings. However, if a standard authorization has just been terminated by the court, for example, because the capacity or best interest requirements are not met, should the court then be permitted to use its general powers to authorize that situation on an interim basis and direct further expert evidence? Or should any continuing dole be left unauthorized until the court is further investigated? I can't promise we'll be able to give you definitive answers to those questions, but. I'm hoping Leonie and Oliver may try. Uh, the court also made useful observations on the use of Section 48 interim orders, though they are strictly obiter observations because they were unnecessary for the determination of the appeal. Our three key points are that specifically, there is a lower evidential threshold for capacity underpinning a Section 48 interim order than a final declaration of capacity under Section 15 and this is, of course, explicit in section 48. Importantly, the presumption of capacity applies with equal force under section 48. The court also confirmed the permissive nature of section 48, which provides a crucial safeguard against interim orders that are disproportionate and an unjustifiable interference with P's autonomy. Section 48, the court said, is not a perfunctory gateway to a protective regime. This demonstrates, I would suggest, that a court must act cautiously, not only when applying the lower threshold for lack of capacity under section 48, but also crucially when interfering with P's autonomy on that lower threshold. With that introduction, and I'm now aware that this case is easier to summarize than to unravel its implications for practice, um, I'm gonna to turn to Oliver Lewis first, for his thoughts on section 48, and then Leonie Hurst on article 5.4 and the need for uh, section 21A hearings to be conducted speedily. So over to you, Oliver. Thank you very much, Aswini. Can I start by also expressing my um, deep sadness at the passing of Stephen Nafla QC. Um, I didn't know him well at all but I and so many of my colleagues in Chambers were looking forward to working with him and learning from him. 
He was a giant in community care law um, and will be missed. And I pass my condolences to um, his family. May Stephen's memory be a blessing. Um, let me turn to section 48 of the Mental Capacity Act. First thing which I find interesting to point out is that section 48 doesn't contain the word declaration. Um, yet Court of Protection practitioners and indeed judges um, have acted as though it does contain the word uh, declaration. So a little bit of history about how section 48 came to be um, in the Mental Capacity Act. Um, and in the deputy district judge's uh, judgment, um, she sought to distinguish between interim and final declarations. And she said, quote, I take into account what the purpose of section 48 was according to the law commission. And then she cited the case of DA and DJ. Um, she went on to say, i.e. section 48 is crafted so as to give the court power to provide relief prior to coming to a final conclusion, end quote. And um, the case of DA and DJ was a judgment by Mrs. Justice Parker from 2017, but um, was only published in March this year. And of uh, important note, it was not a Section 21A application. Uh, as is well known by most people um, listening in, the Dole's regime was inserted as Section 21A uh, the challenge and more particularly in Schedule A1 to the Mental Capacity Act on the 1st of April 2008 for certain purposes and otherwise a year later by the Mental Health Act 2007. And the Law Commission's documents to which Mrs Justice Parker referred was actually written in 1995, 22 years before the introduction of the Dole's regime. And of course it did not consider the Article 5 implications which Leone will speak about in a moment. So reliance on the Law Commission's report is slightly misleading for our purposes. Part seven of the Mental Health Act on which the Law Commission's recommendations were based was repealed by the Mental Capacity Act and concerned the interim management of property and affairs, not freestanding interim declarations of capacity. And the relevant sections of the now repealed Mental Health Act, part seven, um, say, for example, in section 98 uh, is entitled judges powers in cases of emergency. Um, and just to summarize what that says, it says that um, when the judge has reason to believe, there are those words, reason to believe that a person may be incapable by reason of mental disorder of managing admin and administering his property and affairs, dot, 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 then pending the determination of the question uh, about capacity, the judge may, and then the, it goes on to say, essentially give directions um, to deal with um, the pending uh, uh, emergency, whatever that emergency might be. Um, so, uh, and we can see that section 98 of the uh, 1983 Mental Health Act um, isn't new because it's identical to section 104 of the 1959 Act. So the purposes of those provisions in both um, the 59 and 83 Mental Health Acts uh, was to enable the judge to make emergency decisions that the judge considered necessary in relation to property and affairs. But in MCA terms, those would be best interest decisions. Um, so section 48 really doesn't need to be invoked unless best interest decisions needs to be made on P's behalf in an emergency interim basis before full evidence is available to the court. And that's not the case where a doll's authorization is in place. Oh, that's interesting, Ol. Um, so what should a court of protection practitioner do about section 48 and section 21A cases from now on? Yeah, um, and uh, interestingly, um, I had uh, at least three emails from instructing solicitors in the run up to this seminar asking that very question. Um, so I, I think the answer to that is that the case of DP puts an end to section 48 declarations, quote unquote, in section 21A applications, apart from perhaps in the most extreme and bizarre 
circumstances. Um, so interestingly in DP, there was agreement from the local authority that it was wrong for the um, first instance judge to have used section 48. So those points actually didn't come out in the judgment. Um, but I think there are three reasons why the Court of Protection shouldn't use section 48 in section 21A applications. Um, and the three reasons are firstly, that it's wrong in principle. Secondly, there's no need. And thirdly, that it's detrimental to P uh, to do so. And I'll take each of those points in turn. So the first uh, point, which is about principle. And as you said, um, Aswini, um, paragraph uh, 15 of Schedule A1 sets out um, the mental capacity requirements, which is one of the uh, qualifying requirements um, for uh, to which the local authority has to make sure are in place before it grants a standard authorization. And it says that the mental capacity requirement is met if P lacks capacity in relation to the question whether or not he should be accommodated in the relevant hospital or care home for the purpose of being given the relevant care or treatment. Um, in my view, that's quite strange drafting. Um, I, I haven't had the opportunity to look back at the drafting history. Um, others may do so. I think it's strange because um, it, why doesn't it say uh, that it's, um, it, that P lacks capacity to decide uh, whether to remain in the hospital or care home. Um, it's couched in um, sort of more normative terms and I think best interest seems to have crept in because it says that the question is about whether P should be accommodated in the hospital or care home. That leads to um, a slightly satellite question as to why it is, when you look at the wording of the mental capacity requirement, why it is that the Court of Protection routinely directs more information about P's capacity to decide on residents and P's capacity to decide on care in Section 21A applications. And it seems to me that asking about P's capacity to decide on those two domains are in fact the wrong questions um, because uh, the mental capacity requirement is actually a much narrower test. Um, so that satellite question raises a further question about what's become accepted practice in the COP, which is that um, P's capacity to decide on residents is separated out from P's capacity to make a decision about care, also in relation to Section 21A proceedings. And the case relied on um, routinely in letters of instruction, um, and routinely relied on by the official solicitor and the courts is uh, the case of LBX, a judgment of Mrs. Justice Theus in 2013. And that was not a section 21A application. L was living at his father's home. Um, so I think that one of the implications of DP perhaps is for us all to reread the mental capacity requirements in paragraph 15 of schedule A1 and perhaps narrow the scope down. Um, because as Leone will underscore in a moment, section 21A applications are there ultimately to guard against unlawful deprivations of liberty. That's the satellite question back to the principal point. And I think that point really is that the mental capacity requirement is either met or it's not. It cannot be partly met. The question cannot be fudged. And on sufficiency of medical evidence, the European Court of Human Rights uh, held in the case of Sikora and the Czech Republic, which I was involved in in 2012, quote that any deprivation of or, or limitation of legal capacity must be based on sufficiently reliable and conclusive evidence. An expert medical report should explain what kind of actions the applicant is unable to understand or control and what consequences of his illness are for his social life, health, pecuniary interests and so on. The degree of the applicant's incapacity should be addressed in sufficient detail by the medical reports. Now that, that's in sort of Strasbourg language, not in um, MCA language. It was a case, as mentioned, involving the Czech Republic, um, but the point is made. Um, and the reason for that is that the section 21A provision was designed to meet P's rights to 
the Article 5 for review, um, which again, uh, Leone will come to in a moment. Um, and the important point to make, I think, an obvious one perhaps, is that the Court of Protection is independent from the executive. It is not the local authority. It's not there to prop up the local authority. It is the check on the detaining authority. It's the independent safeguard. And it's not the court's role um, to somehow prop up inadequate investigations, uh, sorry, inadequate assessments, as unfortunately the deputy district judge did in the DP case by saying that there's reason to believe that the mental capacity requirement might be met. So that's the principled um, answer to your question, Aswini. The second answer, I think, um, is that there's no need for the Court of Protection to use Section 48 in Section 21A applications. Um, the purpose of Section 48 is to provide the court with the power to make directions or orders pending the determination of an application. That's the wording. If it's in P's best interest to do so without delay, harking back to my earlier point about um, emergency powers. And section 48 is phrased as a permissive power. The court may, is the wording, such that the court need not invoke it to make case management decisions. If the drafters had intended that section 48 was to be invoked in all orders pending the determination of an application, including section 21A applications, the section would have said something like, the court may only dot dot dot, or the court shall dot dot dot. The provision does not mention capacity declarations at all, and it provides the court with the power to make an order or direction, not a declaration, which is the word used in section 15 of the Act. Um, and I think that once the court has received an application pursuant to section 21A, it as you've said, Aswini, may exercise the same powers um, as the High Court, which includes making case management decisions. It's a general principle of law that once a court is seized of a matter, it may make directions until it determines the issue or dispute. And the third reason why the Court of Protection should not or, or need not use Section 48 in Section 21 applications is that it interferes with P's access to justice and right to compensation under Article 5.5 to have an enforceable right to compensation, which is the wording of 5.5. The European Court has held that depriving someone of legal capacity entails grave consequences for various spheres of that person's life. And one of those spheres of life is access to justice for historic wrongs. So by making a declaration of incapacity under section 48, the court prevents P from making a claim for declarations and damages under the Human Rights Act and under common law for false imprisonment in relation to the deprivation of liberty under the Dole's regime. Uh, and the general approach of the courts has been that from the moment the Court of Protection makes that section 48 declaration, the otherwise unlawful de deprivation of liberty becomes lawful because the court has authorized the deprivation of liberty. And it's become a routine practice for the court to make section 48 declarations in section 21A cases without reviewing the lawfulness of detention that article 5.4 requires it to do. And that, in my view, undermines P's rights under Article 5.5 of the ECHR that sets out the right to compensation for breaches of Article 5. So Aswini, that's a long-winded um, uh, way of answering your, your question, hopefully. No, that's really helpful. And But of course, now we've got DP saying that we don't make Section 48 declarations of capacity of interim declarations um, in Section 21A cases. Um, so I'm assuming that means no interim declarations of capacity at all in Section 21A application determinations. Yes, and, the, and the, just to add that the cases that I've done since um, DP has come out, I, I think that judges have accepted um, on the whole um, the removal of the uh, sort of what has become the standard Section 48 um, declarations. And I understand that 
uh, now the uh, that's the official solicitor's position as well. Well, we'll, we'll come to uh, any wider implications once we've covered what we need to cover for today. So with that, I'm going to turn then to Leonie Hurst. Please, Leonie, will you explain Article 5.4 and the implica implications of this judgment for COP practitioners? Um, I'll certainly I'll certainly try. Um, I think it's fair to say at, at the outset that uh, Mr Justice Hayden didn't really deal with the Article 5.4 aspects of DP or deal with um, the uh, very sophisticated arguments which Oliver um, and uh, Victoria um, Butler Cole put to him. But um, it is clearly uh, uh, an underlying and a very important aspect of this case. So Article 5.4 um, gives the right to a speedy review of the lawfulness of a deprivation of liberty by a court. And the purpose of Article 5.4 is to prevent deprivation of liberty becoming arbitrary. So to ensure that individuals who are deprived of their liberty have the ability to access a court which can end the deprivation of liberty if it's unlawful. So Article 5.4 is a crucial part of the protective framework provided by Article 5. But Article 5.4 also has um, three important aspects which are particularly significant in the context of Section 21a proceedings and the Court of Protection more generally. So the first is that the availability of review and the scrutiny which the court will give to a deprivation of liberty in Section 21a proceedings should play an important role in making um, or rather ensuring higher quality decisions by the state which is implementing the deprivation measures. So it has the, um, the, the important sort of disciplinary function of ensuring that uh, decisions which are made are properly evidenced and properly founded in law. The second aspect, and that it's linked to that, is that Article 5.4 requires that the review of a deprivation of liberty is effective. So the court has to have the information before it, which it needs to enable it to make a fully informed decision as to whether the deprivation of liberty is lawful. And we've seen that in other contexts, in particular with parole proceedings um, and, and prison law. So Article 5.4 has important implications in the Court of Protection for the production and quality of evidence in Section 21A hearings. And we can see that in DP with the comments made about the quality of the Dole's capacity assessment um, and uh, what Mr Justice Hayden had to say about, uh, about that. But the third aspect of Article 5.4, which is important, is that, as Oliver has said, there's a right to compensation under Article 5.5. So the Article 5.4 review in which the court determines whether the deprivation is or has been uh, uh, unlawful may continue to be significant even after the deprivation of liberty has come to an end. So um, what's meant by a speedy review under Article 5.4? Well, um, it depends on the circumstances. Uh, speediness is a very flexible concept. And as yet, there's no case law interpreting what's meant by speediness in the context of the Court of Protection. What we do know from Strasbourg case law in other contexts is that the process by which someone's de deprived of their liberty is important. So where, as in Dole's cases, the decision to deprive an individual of liberty is taken by a non-judicial authority rather than a court, a tighter timescale is, is required. And that's consistent, obviously, with the protective scheme of Article 5 and the importance of individual liberty. So whether a review is sufficiently speedy also depends on the circumstances of detention, uh, which is obviously understandable, and the facts of the individual case. So cases with complex factual issues, such as medical conditions or um, prognosis, the complexity of the issues can be taken into account in considering how long is reasonable. So court of protection cases may often, by their nature, be cases where a, a slightly longer time um, for review it, it is sufficient to comply with the speediness requirement. But it can be helpful to look at mental health cases so in the Mental Health Review Tribunal, um, the Article 5.4 requirement for a speedy review has resulted in very robust timescales written into the tribunal procedure rules. So a hearing in mental health cases must be held no more than eight weeks after the reference to the tribunal and sooner if it's urgent. And that hearing is not, as we're used to in the Court of Protection context, a directions hearing or a preliminary hearing. It's a substantive hearing at which the tribunal will review detention and if necessary, make a decision as to discharge. So the documents which are required to enable a tribunal to carry out that review 
have to be with the tribunal within three weeks of the tribunal um, reference or application. And that's, again, part of the aspect of Article 5.4, which requires that review to be effective. Those requirements are backed up by a practice direction, which specifies the contents of the relevant reports and provides that if the reports are not delivered to the tribunal on time, there's a risk of a personal financial penalty against the person in default as a contempt of court. So that is a very robust framework, which is designed to and generally does ensure effective reviews of detention under the Mental Health Act within a very short time scale, even in cases which can be very factually complex. Yes, I can see that. It's, it is an interesting comparison. It, it, it's, it's not an exact comparison, possibly, though, would you agree? Because the Court of Protection certainly has a much wider jurisdiction. Um, it, it can go beyond determining the doll, and it, it has a welfare jurisdiction as well. Um, so how does that um, make a difference, or does it make a difference? I think, I think that's right. I think the potential is for for, for best interest issues to be complicated by their nature because of the need to find available options and to sort out commissioning arrangements. But I think that the issue of capacity is maybe not as, um, as complex as it's often made. Um, and when you look at the statistics, it's really a, a very stark difference in, in court of protection. So a study by Dr. Lucy Series and others in 2017 um, found that the median duration of Section 21 A proceedings was five months. Um, and care and residence proceedings, as opposed to medical treatment proceedings, were taking seven months. Um, my own experience, and I'm sure many people listening will have similar experiences, is that where the Section 21A cases don't settle, they often take much longer than seven months to get to a substantive hearing. And that's even before we've, the very significant delays we've seen caused by COVID-19. Those, those delays are occurring because hearings have been delayed, but also because it's been very difficult for um, local authorities and practitioners to obtain reports and assessments which are needed to inform the court's review. So I think everyone who practices in the court of protection has become used to a series of directions hearings, sometimes over periods of several months, where the evidence is um, from needed for the final hearing is obtained often quite slowly and piecemeal and then requires updating. And I think it's, it's obviously true that Section 21A proceedings can be factually complex, um, particularly where capacity is an issue. But that's also true of mental health um, proceedings. Uh, and I think as things stand, and as they are at the moment, tw Section 21A proceedings are um, very unlikely in most cases to comply with the Article 5.4 requirement for speediness. Um, I think the problem may be that both practitioners and judges have become uh, case hardened, uh, basically become inured to delay in Section 21A proceedings because delay is endemic in this area. And I also think that it's perhaps um, influenced by ageism. So people often tend to think of residential care as uh, suitable or appropriate for older people and very much to under underestimate and undervalue the need for a speedy re review of deprivation of liberty um, as long as the person concerned is safe um, and protection becomes a very important consideration in Section 21A um, proceedings in, in, in the Court of Protection more generally. So I think there's a perception um, both with, within the court and within practitioners that, that in most cases Section 21A reviews don't need to take place urgently or quickly. But if the pandemic and the experience of lockdown has taught us anything, it's that being forced to be somewhere you don't want to be is very stressful and can be very distressing, even if it's a comfortable and pleasant place and very homely. Um, as Baroness Hale said in Cheshire West, a gilded cage is still a cage. But um, what, 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 it, what practical implications would you say that carries for COP practitioners? I think um, that is the million dollar question. And I think that really um, DP is the start of a, of a process, as, as Oliver suggested, um, where there needs to be a cultural shift, both within the court and for practitioners. Um, once the Section 21A uh, proceeding has been brought, the court's function in, those, in that proceeding is to speedily determine whether the qualifying requirements are met. That's its only function. And what that means for practitioners is that the parties have to ensure cooperatively that the evidence available to the court to determine that question is of sufficiently high quality from the outset 
and if necessary that it can be tested in court at the earliest possible stage. So that means I think that practitioners and particularly local authorities need to get used to the production and, and, and testing of robust capacity evidence at a much earlier stage in, in proceedings. We have all of us, I think, become used to a system where DOLS assessments are carried out quickly, sometimes um, in a very superficial way. And the expectation is that the proceedings will sort of rumble on with the production of much more detailed capacity evidence at a later stage. But that's not what the DOLS assessments are about. The purpose of the DOLS assessment um, is to ensure that the qualifying requirements are met before the standard authorization is issued. Not to show simply that the assessments are being carried out. It shouldn't be a tick box exercise, but it often is. And I think that what's contributing to that is that often there's still a lack of understanding about how to assess capacity and how to evaluate capacity assessments. So we all need to think about who's best place to assess P's capacity within the very specific meaning of the mental capacity requirement that Oliver identified and what the relevant information for that decision is. So I think there's often very, a lot of confusion about this. The, the initial assessor doesn't know what the relevant info is because they're not P social worker or they're not involved um, with P's care, but they're rather a clinician who sort of comes in and does the, the assessment. We also often, um, and too often in my submission, suggest that we, we, we see capacity assessments where particularly where P is already in a care home, expressed in terms of P doesn't understand the risk if she went home without support, when in fact no one is suggesting that P would be accommodated anywhere without relevant support. And I think there's uh, often a failure to explain to P what the purpose of the capacity assessment is. So Mr Justice Hayden in DP criticises that as, as likely to fatally undermine the assessment. But it's very common, particularly where the assessor is carrying out at the same time a capacity and best interest um, assessment. And I think in too many cases, um, capacity and best interests are conflated. So that um, where P persists in preferring an outcome which is perceived by others as risky or unsafe, it's interpreted as evidence that P lacks capacity. And that was referred to by Mr Justice Baker in KK as the protection imperative, which is well intentioned, but conflates capacity with best interest but it's still very much happening in, in a lot of assessments in Section 21A proceedings. So I think in terms of what happens in court, what's needed is that the parties really have to focus at a very early stage on the purpose of Section, 20, Section 21A proceedings. Um, applicants need to be clearer in the grounds of application as to which qualifying requirements are challenged. And the court also needs to take a much more active role in moving matters towards uh, an Article 5.4 uh, compliant review. There's no real reason why the judge can't consider the question of capacity at the first hearing. If capacity is contested and the dollars of uh, capacity assessment is not adequate, then the judge can either um, determine that the mental capacity requirement is not met and terminate the standard authorization or list a hearing very shortly afterwards to hear oral evidence so that the court can determine the matter properly. And that's what Mr Justice Hayden is suggesting in DP. And I suspect that that kind of more proactive, robust approach would lead to higher quality capacity assessments and a, a dramatic shortening of the timescales involved in Section 21A proceedings. So I think really what's needed is something of a, a cultural shift. We all need to be much more aware of the purpose of Section 21A, perhaps a little less complacent about P's situation and uh, more aware of the need for um, speediness and the effectiveness of review. Well, that, that's really helpful. I'm going to ask um, Oliver to um, turn on his video as well, because before we turn to the questions that we have, and I haven't had a lot look at them all, but there's some interesting questions there. I just wanted to just sort of try and encapsulate what the two of you have been saying, because it seems to me that you're, you're, you're both advocating the idea that um, it's not necessary to go off and get independent expert capacity evidence. Um, at the during uh, at the first hearing, that the court should look at the best interest assessors and the assessors under the qualifying requirements as the source of the evidence that's that's required for um, for its determination of the lawfulness of the section twenty one a application. So thereby likening it more to a 
with a tribunal style hearing where you're moving very quickly and you're using the available evidence. But leaving aside the issue that capacity assessors have never been called, I don't think, to give evidence and that might scare them, Whitless or any other assessor might find it possibly even, I think I've read, focusing their minds on, on, on the task at hand if they think they might be cross-examined on, on it. I mean, is that roughly how you see it happening? I mean, there's clearly some room for some case management directions, but otherwise a much more shortened process. I think so. I mean, clearly there will um, be cases where a Section 49 report is required or an independent expert report is required. Um, <clears throat> but I think the tendency uh, is to um, read the mental capacity assessment um, grown and uh, because of the low quality of it and then say, OK, well, we need to get, you know, another person to look at this. Um, and so I think the suggestion would be to say, well, OK, that's the state, that's the detaining authorities evidence on mental capacity. Um, so it should be interrogated to in ensure that the mental capacity requirement really is met. Um, and if the presumption, if the evidence is not good enough to rebut the presumption of capacity, the court should determine that the mental capacity requirement is not met. Um, so Leone's suggestion of um, calling the capacity assessor to come and give evidence in you know, 14, list a hearing in 14 days time. Um, if any party wants to file any further evidence that has to be filed in seven days time. And then, you know, in the next hearing, that's the capacity hearing. Um, that brings the whole process uh, much more in line with the requirement of speediness, um, as you, Leo, Leone, have explained um, under Article 5.4. May, may I ask this then? Perhaps Leone can, can deal with this. In, in terms of then uh, how the court investigates, you, you've got possibly a quicker route to investigating capacity depending on how well you identify the decisions and the information that's required for that assessment. You then have to move into best interests, which can be uh, a much more complicated um, decision because you want to look at the available options and the alternatives to P being in the care home, if that's, if that's the kind of case you're dealing with. And, and we know that there are cases, like I think Oliver's recent case of I'm going to say all the wrong K's, it's D, K, and B, M, K, or something in Cornwall, I think that's the identifying, signifying feature, which says that clearly it's part of the court's role to investigate best interests. And we also know from the case of Briggs that that's part and parcel of this investigation, of course, leaving aside for the moment the legal aid issue. So what I'm trying to understand is whether what you're saying is there is still within the speediness concept the possibility and the, the, the ability to investigate best interests thoroughly so that the determination that's ultimately made is a robust one on capacity and best interests all under the umbrella of the section 21a application yes that that's right because we know that the from the strasbourg case law that the complexity of the circumstances of the case and also the circumstances of detention influence what what can, is considered speedy there's not an absolute um time by which it, it will cease to be the review will cease to be speedy and so i think in cases you will have some cases where the best interest question is very straightforward there is there is an identified alternative that can be explored evidence presented in detail very quickly which enables the court to um consider the best interest requirement very very swiftly and I think that can happen actually in a lot more cases than it does. Um, there will be other cases in which it only becomes apparent through the proceedings what the available options are, how um, P's health or how P's um, fluctuating capacity affects those options. There are sometimes issues of commissioning and availability which can be can make those those decisions very difficult. I think what's important though is that everyone involved in the proceedings, including the court, has to keep in sight the need to keep matters progressing towards the effective review. And I think too often there is a sort of feeling that uh, as long as P is safe, then this can all be, this can sort of proceed without much expedition and uh, it will sort of play out in the fullness of time. But that is 
um, it's going to have to stop, frankly, because it, it leads to a, a situation in which matters are allowed to drift. And I don't know if you've seen the today's um, uh, Open Justice Court of Protection blog uh, talking about a, a case in which um, Mrs. Justice Leaven was presiding. And she expressed at one point um, uh, the acerbic comment that it feels unless I, unless I have a hearing, nothing happens. And I think that's a feeling that we're all very familiar with as court protection practitioners, but that isn't how uh, an Article 5.4 compliant process proceeds. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm just now going to look at uh, a couple of the questions. Uh, there are some, a couple of questions on legal aid, which I hope we may have in a way subsumed into our answers. But I want to ask you this one. Um, it's from Tori Smith and she, she asks, how will this work in practice in relation to capacity to conduct proceedings if we are issuing a new Section 21A application? How do we get the OS on board without any declarations in relation to capacity to conduct proceedings? And there was another one on proceedings as well. Um, I think, it, yes, from Sophie Miles, how should the court deal with capacity to litigate? Who wants to try that first, Oliver? Very cheeky of Sophie to ask a, a question instead of answering it. Um, I think capacity to conduct proceedings is quite curious. If you look at the Court of Protection rules, um, uh, rule 1.2, it, it has the, a strange phrasing which sort of turns the presumption of capacity on its head because it says that unless P has capacity to conduct the proceedings, an order joining P as a party shall only take effect on the appointment of a litigation friend or an accredited legal representative. So there's sort of an assumption built in that people lack the capacity to conduct proceedings, which I find um, curious. I, I think that um, two further points. One is that in Section 21A applications, there is always evidence that the mental capacity requirement is met um, because the standard authorization can't be granted without it. Uh, okay, you can have a Section 21A application against an urgent um, authorization, but in practice, it's mostly standard authorizations. Um, and so, and you can't have a Section 21A application without a standard authorization. Um, so, there's always some evidence um, by a uh, suitably qualified clinician about P's mental capacity. Um, but also, there's never uh, any direct evidence about P's capacity to conduct proceedings when a Section 21A is issued, unless there might be previous Court of Protection proceedings where there was expert evidence or something like that. Um, but in regular new Section 21 applications, there's, there is no evidence, direct evidence, that P lacks or has capacity um, to litigate. And so these interim declarations under Section 48 that the Court of Protection has been um, issuing um, have only ever at most been made on the basis of a read across um, from the capacity assessment uh, contained in the Dole's Form 3 or Form 4. Um, as to whether the official solicitor um, adjusts her procedures and policies in, in response to DP, um, I, I don't know. What I do know is that there are um, a few uh, members of staff of um, the Office of the Official Solicitor um, here with us. Um, I don't know whether they'd like to offer a, a thought in the chat, um, but we will just have to wait and see as to um, the response from the Official Solicitor. I just, just wanted to add to that, that of course the question of litigation capacity is separate to, to subject matter capacity and there is quite a lot of case law now, sometimes not, sometimes ignored, that the, the, the person best placed to assess litigation capacity is, is the solicitor, it's the legal representative. So I think, I suspect that some of those issues about um, litigation capacity are going to be addressed as the use of ALRs becomes more widespread, because that will be the expert assessor for the, for the purposes of assessing litigation capacity. But certainly I have, I have um, acted in Section 21A challenges without a litigation friend um, and I haven't, I've met P and been completely satisfied that P has capacity to instruct. So 
I think it's um, it's important not to assume from from the dolls assessments that litigation capacity will automatically be lacking. Okay, um, thank you for that. I, I'm just going to, I think, ask uh, the last one more question here, which to some extent we may already have covered the, the groundwork for this, but it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a scope and legal aid type question. Do you envisage this, 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 this decision having an impact upon the scope of legal aid granted in Section 21A cases? There is clear case law, she says, approving Section 21A as a gateway to other issues, which I think are the cases I mentioned to you earlier. But this decision read, read in conjunction with paragraph 15 of Schedule A1 does appear to narrow the scope quite considerably. Um, you, you may think we've covered some of this, so do you wanna just bring it together if, 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 you, if you can, um, um, Leonie? I'm, I'm happy to try. Uh, I, I mean, this is clearly, there is clearly case law to that effect, not least um, Baker in KK, um, where he was quite happy to consider, continue the proceedings as a section 16 broader welfare, even though the basis on which we, we eventually concluded proceedings was that KK had capacity. Um, I think that the, the, the difficulty is that um, section 21A is the only part of the proceedings which engages Article 5. Um, and Article 5 requires uh, the person, concerned, the individual concerned, the individual deprived of their liberty to have access to the court, which is why Section 21A um, legal aid is non-means tested. Once the section, the, the, the Article 5.4 part of the proceedings has come to a close, then that requirement as an aspect of Article 5 effectively drops away. Obviously, there will be cases in which the, the question of whether the best interest requirement is met for the purposes of Schedule A1 um, can either be dealt with under Section 21A or Section 16 as a broader consideration. Um, my view is that wherever possible, it should be kept within Section 21A proceedings because that's what the court's um, function is under Section 21A proceedings is to determine whether all those requirements have been met. Um, it's not appropriate, I think, following DP, I'm not sure that DP actually um, restricts the scope of, of Section 21A. I think rather it, it simply requires um, those matters to be focused on. So Section 16, I think, would be inappropriate in a case where you had a dolls um, to deal with best interests questions, although, of course, it will obviously still remain available where there's no um, deprivation of liberty or it's already that question's already been dealt with. Yes, not sure that really um, helps though. It, it, it brings to mind again the case of Briggs that we mentioned earlier, which is the Court of Appeal decision, which I can't remember the, the phrase exactly. I was just looking for it and I can't find it on my screen, which is that as long as the essence of the proceedings remains a dull question, it's, um, it, it's fine under Section 21A. Um, and I don't see why that should have been changed by DP. Uh, Aswini, there's, um, I know we've only got three minutes left. Um, someone's asked a question about the implications uh, of DP on non Section 21A applications. Um, and does the no interim declarations rule still apply? Um, just to maybe I could just say uh, a sentence on that. Very important, please do. I think that's one of the things we wanted to come back to about the, the, the availability of interim declarations in, in outside of Section 48. Section 48 doesn't, it isn't about declarations. The word declaration doesn't appear there. So that that's always been wrong. Um, and if you look at the last paragraph of the DP judgment um, where Mr. Justice Hayden sets out um, uh, some practical assistance, which he hopes um, will be useful to the profession. Um, there are nine uh, observations there. And one of them um, is um, the, the fourth one is, he says section 48 is a permissive provision in the context of an emergency jurisdiction, which can only result in an order being made where it's, um, uh, identifiably in P's best interests. Um, so uh, declarations can be made under section 15. The other misnomer in court of protection proceedings is, is this concept of a final declaration, 
well, there is no such thing as a final declaration. The, that there's no fine, final, non-final. Um, it's a declaration of capacity in time. Um, and so the next at uh, the next hearing or the next order may say something different in terms of um, a declaration under section 15. Um, so I, I think that the, D, the DP judgment will have implications as to how the courts um, use section 48 and I would imagine that they would deploy it um, much less frequently. Thank you and I see that David Edward, David Edwards of the official solicitor uh, official Solicitor's Office has said in relation to capacity to conduct proceedings that he doesn't think the OS envisages the absence of a Section 48 declaration as to there being reason to believe P lacks capacity to conduct proceedings will be an obstacle to her accepting the court's invitation to act in a Section 21A case. Of course, if it appears P in fact has capacity to conduct proceedings, then the court will need to be asked to deal with that as an immediate preliminary matter. So there you have it from the horse's mouth almost. Um, we, we are now at five o'clock and there are some other questions but I'm, I'm going to keep to our timing and we will try and answer some of those questions um, um, afterwards and send responses. I think that might be possible uh, if I look at my colleagues and I hope that they're willing to do that. Um, but other than that I'm going to say thank you to both Leone and to Oliver for their presentations today. I think the take home message is go back to the statute, read its terms very carefully. And um, it's always good to re-examine one's practice that's been developed over years, because you might be surprised that there is something there that's been missed and can be rectified. And importantly, in the context of a deprivation of liberty of, of a person's liberty, uh, I think going back to basics is always uh, a very instructive thing to do. So we've, we've done a little bit of that today. So thank you both for that. And I thank everybody for joining us as well. Um, thank you very much and um, goodbye. <laughs>